I would like to thank SAGES for the opportunity to present at the 2020 annual virtual meeting. I will be discussing small bite suturing and its impact on better wound healing. I have no financial disclosures to report. While much of the SAGES membership is comprised of minimally invasive surgery enthusiasts, in addition to many of the surgeons attending this year's conference, we have all taken care of patients who have undergone maximally invasive open surgery and frequently have to heal from a large midline laparotomy wound, which may present challenges, as you can see by the picture featured here. Unfortunately, many of these patients will suffer an incisional hernia, particularly those with known risk factors, including obesity, diabetes, smoking, emergency surgery, and surgical site infection. Some of these patients, however, have no known risk factors for hernia formation. And in reviewing operative reports, commonly they yield that the incision was closed using a standard technique with a running number one looped absorbable suture with a large needle. Incisional hernias occur at a higher rate than most surgeons may realize, with rates ranging from 10 to 30% after abdominal surgery. The risk is higher for midline incisions compared to non-midline incisions and can be as high as 40% in some high-risk populations, particularly patients suffering from morbid or severe obesity. Millions of laparotomies are performed in the United States every year for a variety of reasons, with an estimated 400 to 500,000 incisional hernias occurring postoperatively. We perform hundreds of thousands of hernia repairs in the United States, which has a significant financial impact, costing roughly $3 billion annually. These numbers are quite staggering, and this begs the question for us as surgeons, what are we going to do to help prevent hernias from happening? One of our big challenges is controlling things we have control over to help impact and improve patient outcomes. Importantly, this involves surgical technique to help mitigate the medical and financial burden associated with incisional hernias. This is a question that has been investigated in the literature for some time, starting with animal studies from two decades ago to randomized control trials from five years ago, with one of the key questions being, how does taking small tissue bites impact wound healing? This is an earlier study that looked at small tissue bites and wound strength in rats. These rats were subjected to 6.6 centimeter midline laparotomies and were closed with a continuous running suture technique. The suture length to wound length ratio was over four for each laparotomy closure and three separate groups with stitches placed at three, six, or 10 millimeters from the wound edge were analyzed. The outcomes assessed were bursting pressure and bursting volume immediately after and four days after laparotomy closure. The results showed that the bursting pressure and volume were both decreased in the 10 millimeter group relative to the three and six millimeter groups respectively on day four. The bursting pressure was highest among all groups on day four for the rats closed with bites that were six millimeters from the wound edge for a total of 16 stitches using the continuous suturing template shown here on the right side of the slide with the gold star. Moving forward almost 10 years, the same authors previously discussed conducted a randomized control trial in Sweden and published their results in 2009. This trial had over 700 patients who underwent emergent or elective abdominal surgery via a midline laparotomy. They were randomized either to a short stitch running fascial closure technique using 2OPDS suture on a 20 millimeter needle staying five to eight millimeters from the wound edge or the long stitch technique using a one OPDS suture on a needle twice its size and at least one centimeter from the wound edge. The short stitch group focused on only taking bites of aponeurosis. At one year follow-up, the short stitch group had significantly lower wound infections and incisional hernia rates compared to the long stitch group. Another five years later, the much anticipated stitch trial, which was a multi-center randomized control trial conducted in the Netherlands, was published. 
This study had almost 600 patients undergoing only elective abdominal surgery via midline laparotomy who were randomized to a small bite running fascial closure technique using two OPDS suture on a 31 millimeter needle, staying five millimeters from the wound edge and with five millimeter spacing intervals between bites, or the large bite group using a number one PDS suture on a 48 millimeter needle, taking one centimeter bites from the wound edge with one centimeter spacing intervals. While surgical site infections were similar between the small and large bite groups, the small bite group did have significantly lower incisional hernias. Of note, the study population in both trials were relatively similar, with 40 to 50 percent of patients being female, a mean age in the low to mid 60s, and a BMI close to 25. We now know that suture material and fascial closure techniques are important contributors to wound healing and the development of incisional hernias, particularly during the critical healing period postoperatively for wounds, which is the first four weeks. When it comes to closing midline incisions, some key points to minimize complications are summarized herein. These include the use of monofilament suture, either a slowly absorbable form or a non-absorbable form, in addition to a smaller suture size, with 2.0 being the preferred size. The needle type should be a taper tip with a smaller size profile. A continuous running fascial closure technique is preferred, but needs to be done with smaller tissue bites from the wound edge, ideally 5 to 8 millimeters focusing on grabbing just the aponeurosis with spacing intervals at about five millimeters. Another key concept is that your suture to wound length ratio must at least be four, which is impacted both by the distance from the wound edge in addition to the stitching interval, with small bites at closer intervals being the preferred method. The photo featured here demonstrates the small bite running fascial closure technique described in the STITCH trial. Despite the findings of these convincing trials, small bite fascial closure techniques are not common practice. So why is it taking so long to gain traction among surgeons and what are some of the obstacles that are present? I think one of the key barriers and perhaps one of the hardest to fix is entrenched practices and cultural mindset. Surgeons like to operate how they have trained and have been taught, and using a new technique can be out of their comfort zone. They may not have access to surgeons who have trained with the principles of these newer fascial closure techniques in their current facilities. They may not be experts in wound closure and hernia prevention, and thus have poor knowledge of the literature and what these new techniques entail. Other popular arguments and obstacles are that the study patients are not like the patients in real life and therefore don't apply to current surgeon's practices. There is also a small increase in closing time associated with small bite fascial closure technique, and this may not be palatable for some surgeons. And last but not least, the hernia can always be fixed at a later date, so let's not worry about it during the index operation. Another practical obstacle to adopting these newer fascial closure techniques are the actual supplies at our disposal. The suture size, needle type, and needle size combination described in the STITCH trial, for example, is not sold in the United States. And thus we have to find the closest substitute at our own facilities. In my institution, for example, the closest substitute we have is featured on the right side of the slide, which is the 2 OPDS suture on a 26 millimeter taper point needle. This is as good as it gets for us as we learn to adopt these new techniques in my facility. In conclusion, we now have convincing data to support optimization of wound healing and midline fascial closure techniques with the use of smaller needles and smaller suture material, smaller bites of aponeurotic tissue from the wound edge, as well as a suture length to wound length ratio of at least four. Our focus as surgeons needs to be on prevention of hernias rather than dealing with their aftermath, and adopting surgical techniques at our disposal to help accomplish this is paramount. As we think about next steps, it is important to recognize leading societies in this area, including the AHS, or America's Hernia Society. 
The AHS launched the Stop the Bulge campaign in 2018, recognizing that a number of hernias are potentially preventable. There has been a lot of effort put toward this campaign, both from a research and educational standpoint. Certain important research topics include long-term follow-up on small bite fascial closure techniques, the use of prophylactic mesh augmentation, and the application of these techniques in higher BMI patients. In addition, meetings to highlight best practices and safe surgical technique for abdominal wall reconstruction, educational PowerPoints, and promotion of lifelong learning through the AHS Education Committee are all important initiatives associated with this campaign. As demonstrated in the 2019 AHS annual meeting, we are all better together as surgeons, and this requires a collective multidisciplinary effort to improve the quality of care for patients suffering from hernias. I would like to thank SAGES again for the opportunity to speak, as well as the AHS and my well-respected hernia colleagues, experts, and mentors who have always provided insight and guidance to me and many other surgeons.